Today, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Rustam Barucha, who will speak to us or with us about thinking through the pandemic, a performative perspective. Um, I, it, it, it is especially uh, a pleasure for me because the first time I met Rustam was um, in 1997, when I was rather young um, as a student, and he was already eminent, which he continues to be. Rustam is the author of Theatre and the World, The Politics of Cultural Practice, The Question of Faith, In the Name of the Secular, Rajasthan and Oral History, Another Asia, and Terror and Performance. He is in the process of completing a new monograph on the second wave of the pandemic in India, which deals with death, grief, mourning, and extinction. Do remember that you can type in your questions in the Q&A box. And we would love to have your, have your feedback uh, because that is what keeps us on our toes, but it also helps us understand whether we are reaching you and what else you would like to see. With this, may I invite you, Rustam, to share your thoughts with us this evening. Thank you, Janavi, for your introduction. I'd like to thank you and all your colleagues at Science Gallery for inviting me to give a talk in your lecture series. I find it heartening that even as the pandemic is still with us, that there are emergent institutions in India like yours that are initiating cutting edge, interdisciplinary, critical perspectives around science. And I think this is the best possible way of freeing science from its somewhat formidable aura of expertise and making it available and questionable uh, in the cultures of everyday life. So congratulations to all in Science Gallery. Today, I'd like to share some thoughts on the relationship between the pandemic and the practice of theater and performance. I'll begin with some programmatic statements and reflections in a global context. And at some point, there will be a shift in register as I reflect more introspectively on the pandemic, focusing on its existential and planetary dimensions. I should begin by acknowledging that I seem to have developed a relationship with the pandemic. This began in the early months of the lockdown in March, April 2020, when I felt an inexplicably creative urge to map, conceptualize, formulate, speak out, and perform what became a nine episode video lecture on theater and the coronavirus. I'd be grateful if Science Gallery could pass on that link to everyone attending this talk. Now, doing this video lecture was a very uncanny experience because I brought together these episodes in an astonishingly short span of time. At an almost unconscious level, it almost seemed as if the virus had entered my words that mutated at a feverish speed. At a more conscious level, I do believe that this video lecture ignited because I was filled with a sense of outrage and rage by the global closure of theaters worldwide, which we seem to be forgetting already. But from my point of view, this would have to be regarded as an unprecedented event in the history of theater, and we shouldn't forget it. <clears throat> what angered and dismayed me was not so much the closure of theaters per se, and I dare say this may have been necessary at many points in time, but what dismayed and angered me was the fact that there was no public debate, no discussion, no dissent, sorry, no negotiation <clears throat> of this critical decision. Theater artists and institutions across the world simply capitulated to the dictates of the state and municipal authorities in the name of security, public health, and what I would regard as global civil obedience. Not only did theater abandon its autonomy and right to think critically and independently in the larger domain of civil society, it failed to engage with the most fundamental concerns relating to the livelihood of actors and other employees of the theater industry. And the effect was catastrophic. Millions of artists were rendered jobless, Many were pauperized 
ranging from the employees of capital intensive theater industries on Broadway and the West End to the undocumented performers, thousands and thousands of such performers from the most marginalized sections of society in the rural and subaltern sectors of India. At no point did the Indian state acknowledge the precarity and predicament of artists within its borders and no provisions for emergency funds were made for artists during the crisis, which continues. It was left to a few state governments and independent cultural groups to provide limited financial assistance to the artists. Now, when I confront this official indifference to the lives and livelihood of artists, I'm reminded of a statement that I had invoked in the opening episode of my video lecture, and the statement is simply this, let the artists die, which is the title of a production by the famous Polish theater director, Tadeusz Kantor. While the title may seem unduly harsh and cynical, I do believe that it gets to the core of how artists tend to be treated as expendable in the larger political economy because of their allegedly inessential services. It is this disparagement that I dare say fueled the rage underlying my video talk and that's what enabled me to write it in a very short span of time. Once I decided to lecture about the pandemic in a performative context, I found myself turning to the most devastating pandemic of the last century, the Spanish flu of 1918 to 19, which is said to have killed in one estimate around 50 million people in the world. The largest percentage of casualties was centered in and around Bombay. And yet how many of us are even aware of the Spanish flu in India even at the level of so-called general knowledge. It has not entered our textbooks. It has certainly not entered our theatrical narratives or imaginaries, almost disappearing into oblivion. One reason for this oblivion, as the historian David Arnold has pointed out in this lecture series, has to do with its meager cultural representation outside the official archives. Professor Arnold tells us that there is, to the best of his knowledge, not a single photograph available of the Spanish flu pandemic in India. Now, how is this possible when one considers the profuse visual evidence of the 1896 plague in Bombay, which has been featured so inventively in Science Gallery's exhibition on contagion? This absence of images of the Spanish flu in India cannot be attributed to a moratorium on visual representation because contrary to all assumptions, theaters and cinema houses remained open in cities like Calcutta, Bombay, London, and New York, even as people died in large numbers. So how does one account for the persistence of theater and cinema in such a state of emergency? One could speculate that people were emotionally drained and exhausted after four arduous years of the World War, and they, that they desperately needed some form of distraction and entertainment. Significantly, the most popular show in London during the worst months of the Spanish flu in 1918 was the blatantly escapist orientalist musical extravaganza called Chu Chin Chao, which ran for thousands of performances. Now, can one assume from this fact that it is escapism and a desperate need to forget the double onslaught of the war and the pandemic that fueled this thirst for theater? Not entirely. Without referring to any pandemic, and I think that when we talk about the pandemic, we have to talk about epidemics as well. We also have to deal with uh, disasters of different kinds. So I call your attention to one of the worst man-made disasters in the Indian context, perhaps the most brutal instance of colonization, the Bengal famine of 1943, which resulted in the deaths of close to 3 million people. As Amartya Sen has pointed out, these deaths cannot be attributed to a particularly bad harvest, but to the fact that people were denied access to food by the colonial administration. Thousands of peasant families from the rural areas of Bengal migrated to the city 
of Kolkata, where a large majority starved to death. I'd like to repeat that, starved to death. Others survived by fighting with each other, not so much for a handful of rice, but for the residues of starch, rice, water in which the rice had been cooked. Such was the misery, suffering, and deaths of millions of people, which significantly has been recorded through a massive number of photographs and even film footage. Now, in this dark moment, theaters and cinema halls remained open in Kolkata. These shows extended not only to commercial theater productions and films, but to one of the most complex artistic achievements of that time, which remains a landmark in the exploration of epic realism in the Indian theater, Bijan Bhattacharya's Nobanno, the Great Harvest, which dared to dramatize the famine in its opening production on 24th October, 1944. This production, as we know, is theater history, intrinsically linked to the formative moments of IPTA, the Indian People's Theater Association. There's a lot that one can say about it. The, the internecine tensions between the director Shambhu Mitro and the Communist Party of India that was producing the play, Mitro's insistence on a revolving stage and so on and so forth. But what the pandemic has succeeded in doing, this pandemic has succeeded in doing, is that it has, it has compelled me to rethink my own connections to this theater history at a more intimate and empathetic level. I, I feel it more deeply. I'm challenged at two levels. How was it possible for the theater artists of this landmark production to have staged a play about the famine, even as it was in the process of ending? We know that it takes a very long time before any disaster can be processed imaginatively in the theater in order to produce a significant work of art. And yet Nobonno coexisted almost simultaneously with the worst onslaught of the famine, testifying to the extraordinary courage and creative determination of the artist. My, my respect for them deepens. And I can tell you very candidly, it's going to take us a very, 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 very long time before we can come up with a production, the stature and the scale and the complexity of a Nobono to deal with our pandemic. Secondly, and no less staggeringly, what is it that compelled hundreds of spectators to go to the theater to relive the tragedy of everyday life that they had recently experienced? Would we be able to go to the theater walking through streets on which hundreds of people had died and starved to death? Or would we prefer to stay safe indoors? What are the compulsions that drive people to go to the theater in states of emergency, regardless of the costs? During our pandemic, we didn't really have to face the ethical complexities of this question because all the theaters were shut anyway. So why did we allow them to be shut? Why was there no picketing of theaters and demand to occupy abandoned theaters, which materialized only in March, 2021, when artists in Paris occupied the Odeon Theatre, which opened after a two month protest. But for the most part, the sepulchral silence of closed theaters in most parts of the world can be attributed, I would say, to a deep fear of dying and of being infected. I don't think we want to really acknowledge this fear. We're too cool, right? But we're living with fear. Now, this is ironic given the fact that we have more medical facilities than ever before to counter or to control the pandemic. This was not the case in 1918 when the virus was mistaken for Pfeiffer's bacillus and antibiotics, ventilators, and advanced oxygen treatment were not available. Let me stop right here. The reference to oxygen, a life resource, compels us to qualify the alleged professionalism of our medical infrastructure. Didn't a number of people in Delhi and elsewhere choke to death in the non-availability of oxygen not so long ago? Can the vehement denials of the state and health ministry and hospital administrations compel us to forget this dereliction of public duty? 
So let's qualify with all our profuse medical supplies, etc. There are glitches, there's indifference, there's criminal negligence. Likewise, we live in the global information order where there is no dearth of messages relating to the pandemic on social networks and tracking devices. This was not the case in 1918-19 when medical information and epidemiological investigation was a lot more restricted if not absent. Here again, the problem for us could be, yes, we have all this information, but perhaps there was too much information. There was too much, there were too many contradictory and colliding messages. And this resulted, I would say, in some kind of a confusion and a kind of mental paralysis and COVID fatigue. Finally, unlike the Spanish flu years, when there was only the theater, the cinema hall, the pub that provided source of, sources of entertainment in, in cities like London, today, all over the world, we can binge on Netflix through the night, at least for those of us who can afford Netflix, who have computers on which connectivity can be guaranteed and who have electricity to fall back on these facilities are not available to millions of people in our country. So along with Netflix for the privileged few, we also had the possibility of seeing online performances, which proliferated during the pandemic, even as artists were more often than not unpaid for their creative labor. I would look upon this as an ethical lapse, and I would say that we have a very long way to go before we develop an economy uh, for virtual theater in a more equitable manner. So in the spectrum of online performances, which acquired the status of a new performance genre, we witnessed everything from bad Zoom theater to the most inventive forms of virtual communication. I will restrict myself to three observations. One, the online performances that seemed to work, at least for me, were those that were not in denial of the pandemic, but which actually incorporated its immediacies into new narratives. Two, the best examples were those that avoided the strictures of Zoom and created other more fluid and random forms of communication, like Maya Krishna Rao's phenomenal improv improvisation in 18 two minute oral soundscapes accessed on the smartphone. In this serial-like narrative, we got to know a crazy character called Paro, a belligerent Malayali living in a dysfunctional North Indian family in Delhi, who embarks in true communist style on a long march from Delhi to Kerala. It's pure farce. On this journey, she encounters, and here's the shift, 14 migrant laborers who have secreted themselves in the interior of a cement mixer attached to a truck in order to travel in a clandestine way from Maharashtra to Uttar Pradesh during the lockdown. So in this encounter, Rao's strategic use of farce intercuts with a human tragedy that was only too familiar during the lockdown with the migration of thousands of laborers to their rural homes. The access to Rao's nar narrative in these, I stress, two minute soundtracks, they're just little bites, you know, unsettled my own lockdown routine at home, reminding me of the privilege of being able to stay at home while millions were homeless. Finally, I would say that the virtual theater experiments that seemed to work most decisively were those that were not afraid to fail. In a time of crisis, when the time is out of joint, it is foolish to assume along with Hamlet that we can set it right. Our only intelligent option is to work with the out of jointness of time. We have to develop a new rhythm in our work. As for the propensity to fail, we should remember Samuel Beckett's caustic advice, fail, fail again, but fail better. Do we have the courage to fail? Let me now ask the crucial question. What exactly was the source of the fear in entering theaters? I'm referring to proscenium theaters, black boxes, basement theaters, 
and other such enclosed spaces. It was assumed that such spaces were the most likely to be contagious with a multitude of viruses swarming in them. They were potential death sites. An apprehension, I would say, perhaps a valid apprehension that was never really tested or subjected to epidemiological analysis. Focusing on the trope of contagion, I would say that the most profuse archival sources of this phenomenon in a theatrical context can be found in records relating to the public theater houses of Elizabethan England, which were shut down for 78 months between 1603 to 1613 on account of the plague. And that's a period of six years and six months. Now, when I encounter a statistic, and this is a very rigorously researched statistic by theater historians, when I encounter the statistic which comes from another theater culture seemingly distant, it's not distant from me at all, it hits me. It resonates. At that time, the Puritans, the enemies of theater, obviously rejoiced because the plague provided them with more justification for their venomous attack on the institution of theater as evil. More than the cross-dressing lascivious players, it was the spectators from the artisan professions who were targeted as the conduits of contagion. As the theater hating Puritan lawyer William Prynne put it in forthright terms, quote, play haunters are contagious in quality, more apt to position, to infect all those who dare approach them than one who is full of plague sores. So if you've got the plague, it would seem you're less dangerous than that spectator in the public playhouse. Returning to our enclosed proscenium theaters during the pandemic, it was not so much the bodies of spectators or the sensation of touch that was perceived as the primary source of infection, but the more elusive, invisible, if not ephemeral atmosphere of the theater. It was the air of the theater, replete with aerosols, vapors, and droplets that was perceived as the source of contamination. Now this opens up the crucial dimension of breath, which is simultaneously feeding the atmosphere and drawing on it. Breath has been massively valorized in theater research with a particular focus on the psychophysical dimensions of actor training. It is axiomatic to say that breath is the source of energy in any performance. It is what enables actors to project their voices and opera singers to belt out their arias. In Indian performance traditions like Kudiyatam and Kathakali, breath is intrinsically related to the subtleties of Satvika Abhinaya. The minute tremors on the cheek or the change of color on the face are all made possible through intense disciplines of breathing. In this regard, breath is aestheticized and becomes an artistic performative resource. So much so that one forgets that breath is also necessary in order to live. What the pandemic has opened up is a new understanding of the sociality of breath. That's an enormous intervention. In an unprecedented revelation, it has made us aware not only of the breath of the actor, but of the breath of the spectator. To this day, I don't believe that there has been any systematic study of spectatorial breathing, apart from the occasional olfactory disparagement of onions and garlic associated, for instance, with the penny stinkards who frequented the Elizabethan playhouse. But the possibility that the normal breathing or <coughs> civilized coughing of the spectator in a proscenium theater could be the source of infecting the theater space. This is a new proposition altogether. Now at one level, all this concern about the contagion of theater spaces is somewhat misplaced because if we had to open the templates of theater buildings worldwide, we would encounter a recurring principle that theater is essentially a protected space. So in the opening chapter of the Nathya Shastra, for instance, before it embarks on listing its encyclopedic 
genealogies and taxonomies of different performance categories, we encounter something along the lines of a strategy for enabling Nokia to exist in the first place. Now, many of you must be familiar with this opening chapter where Bharata's 100 sons are performing the defeat of the demons by the gods far too confidently in the celestial realm, blissfully indifferent to the asuras in the audience. Never underestimate the audience. Needless to say, the asuras resent the ways in which they are being defeated on the stage and they proceed to storm the performance space, paralyzing the actors who forget their lines. Later, the terrified actors approach the god Brahma for a solution to subsequent disruptions of performance. And Brahma, like a wise diplomat, advises, build a playhouse and ensure that each and every inch of the space, all the pillars and cardinal directions will be protected by some god or guardian deity or the other, so that the history of Nakhya can continue uninterrupted. Now, for me, this is not so much a fable or a myth as a peremptory condition for performance. It's a very intelligent strategy. One could argue that in later generations in other cultures with the advent of modernity, when gods are assumedly dead, that the protective role of the gods has been replaced by the rules and regulations of civil society and public culture. The irony is that the supposed bastions of free speech and iconoclastic gestures in the theaters of the most advanced liberal democratic societies in Europe are also among the most policed of spaces. Everything from fire laws to legalities, protecting audiences from the disruption of performances by activists is ensured, so much so that these theaters resemble fortresses. And yet, isn't it humbling that they remain vulnerable to the invasion of invisible viruses, imagined or real? Outside the proscenium theater and other enclosed performance spaces, one should point out that theater has explored many other spaces in the public sphere, site-specific spaces, open spaces, found spaces, abandoned factories, car parks, even natural landscapes. There has been no dearth of experimentation in these spaces by avant-garde artists. And yet it's deeply puzzling to me, why, why did these artists fail to explore such spaces during the pandemic, which would have posed far less of a risk and health hazard, given the air circulation of these relatively open spaces and flexibility in terms of seating. Significantly, it has been left to activists linked to movements like Black Lives Matter and the movement against the Citizenship Amendment Act in India, who have converted streets into public assemblies, which have become the sites of the most incendiary performances of our time. So we didn't get to see performances in the theater, but there was no dearth of performances on the streets. While these assemblies have been critiqued for restricting the mobility of traffic and pedestrians, there's no conclusive evidence to suggest that they resulted in a massive outbreak of infection. This is because activists of Black Lives Matter have realized the importance of masking and observing protocols of social distancing. We also need to keep in mind that the protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act in Shaheen Bagh ended once the lockdown was imposed by the Delhi government. There was no anarchist attempt to break the rules. Ironically, it is politicians who have audaciously broken the rules while canvassing for votes and large election rallies without wearing masks or observing the basic protocols of social distancing. And yet their performances have been allowed to pass in the larger interests of democracy. So at this point, let me shift the thematic and tonal register of this talk by returning to the first months of the lockdown in 2020, when my living room began to resemble a waiting room. Instead of waiting for 
anything, waiting for Godot, who doesn't show up, or waiting for the vaccine, which does show up with multitudinous vengeance, creating new disparities, inequities, antagonisms, and racial discriminations in the process. What would be the difference if we focus simply on waiting itself? So in this part of the lecture, I'll try to link waiting to the crucial task of breathing, without which we're unlikely to survive the pandemic. So let's look upon waiting as a condition a time past duration with ups and downs, highs and lows, a fluctuating energy held together by an underlying discipline. Not a replication of the discipline imposed by the state through quarantine regulations, which has at one level locked us in a state of voluntary house arrest, but an inner discipline of the kind that Gandhi had practiced during the Spanish flu. Gandhi himself did not suffer from the flu, he suffered from dysentery, but he used that time to stay put. He did not budge from his room while admonishing everybody around him for their mindless movement. Gandhi believed there is one and only one really effective way by which we can save ourselves even in our present broken state of health. That way is the way of self-restraint or of imposing a limit on our acts. Now, this discipline might seem like too stern an injunction for us to practice today, when the need of the hour would seem to be distraction. But without some kind of inner discipline of our own creation, it's hard to imagine how we can survive the pandemic at psychological and creative levels. Waiting is positioned between stasis and movement. So on the one hand, as dance theorist and choreographer Andrea Lepecki has suggested, it becomes essential not to unconditionally accept the management, surveillance, and control of movement by the apparatus of the police and state authorities, but on the other hand, in one's resistance to these constraints, the alternative is not to revert to the frenetic speed, the mindless kinetics driving neoliberal capitalism. In this impasse, Lepecki makes a very sharp maneuver in his argument, which I do believe could come only from a choreographer, when he advocates the exploration of a movement in the pause. So it's not pause in the movement, it's a movement in the pause. What makes this movement so cognitively rich is that it embodies a stillness in Lepecki's words, which is simultaneously refusal, potentiality, and action. When I hear these words, the first association that comes to mind, I really don't have to think too hard, is the vision and practice of the great Indian choreographer, Chandraleka. She actually understood and explored the principle of movement in the pause through her rigorous allegiance to the discipline of yoga, through which an inner movement or circuit of energy, as she called it, could be embodied in a state of stillness. Perhaps the most difficult of asanas, which also appears to be the most deceptively simple, is the shavasana. The asana in which infinitesimal breath animates the still simulacrum of a dead body. What needs to be kept in mind is not the formalism or technique of yoga, but the fact that it is animated by prana and inner energy and life force that makes the act of breathing mindful, ensuring the resilience of the spine. It is this resilience that enables us to confront, in Chandraleka's words, the daily assaults on our senses and the unprecedented degradation of our bodies. As she often put it, if your spine is not fully energized, you will not be able to find the capacity to resist or to act. And when she spoke like this way back in the 70s, of course, many of her admiring activists were a bit cynical about all of this, but I think many of them today have come around to accepting that the body is absolutely integral. It's absolutely central to the larger process of self-transformation and social transformation. 
I consider myself privileged to have seen almost all the rehearsals of Chandralekha's legendary production of Prana, which she described as a homage to breath, structured around the grid of the Navagraha and set to the sublime musical composition of Muthuswami Dikshitara's Navagraha Kritis. I remember the dancers creating each of the nine planets that evolved on stage through asanas to the slowest of movements in Vilambit Kal. The overall effect was not just mesmerizing, but almost planetary in its experience with the body representing the Sharida Mandala of the universe. Here, I'd like to return to the issue of space that I brought up earlier in this lecture and suggest that Chandralekha's open air dance space appropriately named Mandala on the basis of its holistic measurements represents a blueprint of the kind of post-pandemic performance space that we so urgently need. Far removed from the claustrophobia of the proscenium theater and its derivations, what we experience in the Mandala theater, open to the sky and adjacent to the sea, is a space that breathes. So we're not talking about breathing in a space, we're talking about a space that is breathing. It is also a space that knows how to take care of itself, like renewable energy, not requiring any maintenance. Above all, it is a space that reveals an odd kind of elasticity insofar as it can accommodate one person with as much flexibility as it can embrace an entire audience. I'm well aware that not every theater aesthetic is necessarily conducive to the holistic principles of the mandala, but its principles adapted and translated are well worth keeping in mind in, response, in responding to the challenge that we face in searching for an ecology of space. Likewise, I realize there's a danger in valorizing a discipline like yoga, because like all creative resources, it can have a darker side to its transformative principles. In this regard, we should keep in mind, as Chandralekha was well aware, that yoga has become integrated into the military disciplines of army training, beginning with the war in Vietnam, perhaps earlier. The potentiality of self-transformation can be misappropriated by the discipline of killing. Nonetheless, while acknowledging these distortions, the capacity of yoga to revitalize breath cannot be undermined in an age that is characterized by chronic breathlessness, as pointed out by philosopher Franco Berardi. If we had to designate an epitaph for this age, I do believe it could be reduced to three words, I can't breathe. At one level, this is something that we may all feel at random moments, especially if you're living in a city like Delhi as we choke behind our masks, which are meant to be worn for our protection and for the safety of those around us. But more critically, these words have to be linked to those victims of racist police brutality in the United States and elsewhere, where African-Americans like George Floyd, Eric Garner, and other victims have choked to death, repeating the words, I can't breathe. It is said that Floyd repeated the word breathe 11 times before he died. It is possible to describe this form of resistant breathing as a form of combat breathing, to use a category theorized by Franz Fanon in his unprecedented understanding of how colonization doesn't merely deny people some basic rights, colonization can succeed in suffocating the bodies of its subjects and disfiguring them, breaking their spines. While combat breeding can be imposed on the colonized as an imposition of power, it is also possible for peace activists to reappropriate its techniques for their own modes of survival and resistance. In attempting to inflect how any resource, whether it is yoga or breath, can be used in diametrically opposed ways, we are compelled to remember with Wittgenstein that the meaning is in the use. In addition, we are compelled to acknowledge that there are no quick or permanent solutions to any crisis. 
This pandemic is likely to be with us for a long time, disappearing and reappearing, and we have no other choice but to live with it. To arrive at new resources of hope, to borrow a phrase from Raymond Williams, we will need to create new practices that question our complicities in the normal. So far from wanting to return to the normal, for God's sake, or to settle for a new normal, we should question how this normal may have precipitated the pandemic through the zoonotic jumping of species, which can be linked, though not at a causal level, to our consumerist capitulation to the larger forces of global capitalism, dependence on fossil fuels, deforestation, and genetic engineering. For new practices, we need new mindsets and a greater capacity to relate the depredations of the global to the life-sustaining resources of the planetary, as Amitav Ghosh has been emphasizing so persuasively in his recent writings. For us in the theater, I would say we can no longer remain confined within an anthropocentric mindset with purely humanocentric concerns and a mindless use of energy resources. We need to open ourselves to new understandings of energy conservation and to new connections with the non-human world, the animal world, the plant world, whose resources have been deliberately kept out of the epistemic foundational principles of theater. Whether we draw on the nature-laden poetics of Kalidasa or the knowledge traditions of indigenous communities worldwide, we need to be prepared to learn. Or as Gayatri Spivak would put it, learn to learn. Are we prepared to unlearn our imagined expertise and open ourselves to a new humility? It is only through this humility that we can begin to find a new ground for our practices and in this crucial sense, we could say that despite its ferocious force and impact, the pandemic has also offered us a wake up call to rethink our existence. In this sense, I would regard it as a gift, but are we prepared to receive it? Can we act on it? I'll leave you with these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rustam, for a thought-provoking lecture and for sharing your thoughts with us. I think what you're what you're asking for uh, uh, asking for our attention um, towards is our you know um, ideas that will allow us to reset and begin um, to think about how we might integrate the learning from the pandemic into uh, cultural life, shape cultural institutions. You speak of theater. In our case, it's a public space for science. And how we might actually move ahead with, uh, you know, with with uh, this in mind, because the the bigger challenges are still there, right? Like this isn't, unfortunately, from everything we learned the last pandemic we've had, and if you know, uh, of course, as a historian, I always find it difficult to believe predictions, but nonetheless, it is not at all outside the realm of plausibility that, given how we have arranged um, cohabitation on the planet with with other species, uh, this is only likely to recur. Yeah. And therefore, um, your words of caution, especially as you weave them into your understanding of theater and theatrical practice and what has what we have witnessed. Um, I, I especially found interesting your idea that um, while um, public presence for electoral politics was seen as democratic, uh, democratically essential, Mm -hmm. But that the same for protest, of course, was not. And in fact, we saw protests being curbed globally in extremely um, mm -hmm. strong ways. Um, and in fact, in uh, protest emerging in rather interesting ways, even right now. I mean, we've had we've had riots in the Netherlands in just mm -hmm. the last one week against uh, lockdown and um, mm -hmm. a, a stricter imposition of vaccine um, um, vaccine well, get, people getting vaccinated. So we, we, we uh, I suppose every generation in a way identifies, uh, you know, uh, the strangeness of their times, but it wouldn't be, wouldn't be an exaggeration to say this is in, we have indeed entered a rather interesting phase yeah. uh, if we look at the long 20th century. So um, with this, uh, so I'd, I'd like to 
um, you know, so, so I mean, you, you've laid out the lay of the land so clearly, you know, in terms of how theaters might imagine, reimagine themselves. Um, and I remember, um, you know, that during the early days of the pandemic, um, a theater director from a New York, small New York theater, and I, I will hopefully by the end of this session remember his name and theater, but he talked about how theater as a practice is all is, is several thousands old. I mean, you know, just as democracy, it finds uh, at least its known roots. It's, you know, uh, performance, of course, has been endemic to all cultures through, you know, from, from whatever we know about, know about the deep past. But what we understand as sort of theatrical performance and, you know, it's, it's sort of at least Greek antecedents for Europe and therefore also for the idea of democracy, you know, seem to kind of convert in one place. But um, um, so he, he spoke about how essentially the, 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 the experience of theater is one that is collective, it is, is one that is of togetherness and it's one of, um, you know, coming together and, and it has survived it has survived the arrival of various media, you know, um, it has uh, survived the arrival of cinema, of television, of the internet. And so in, in many ways, we don't quite see the end of it. And in fact, there was an interesting research, live research project that we ran during Contagion, which hopefully will be turned at least into a master's thesis, if not a publication. The starting point for which was that it has been observed that within the first um, few minutes of uh, arriving in a theater, the heartbeats of the audience mm -hmm. begin to sink. <laughs> and I think that's, I mean, that's tremendous. That's, that's something tremendous to understand. And, 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 uh, and there are people working on this. And they, they of course, carried out an, uh, an online exp experiment because we couldn't do it. Um, uh, we couldn't do it <laughs> in live or in real life. But so, uh, you know, just, just to ask you for a few thoughts of yours on how you perceive this collective experience of bodies coming together and experiencing theater together, uh, be it large or small, um, and, and therefore what might be foreground or what, how might we approach it now? Um, you know, I'm, um, I was like all of us, I guess, I was imprisoned and in my house, in my room, for 18 months or so. And then uh, there was this little window of opportunity to encounter a theater festival in Munich uh, called yeah. Spielmacht. It was wonderful. And I have to say, I have never ever enjoyed a festival more in my entire life. You know, one can be a little jaded and cynical. Festivals can exhaust you, you know, like yeah. supermarkets, you're running from one show. What I loved about this festival is its lightness, you know? It was just, uh, it, there were no mega productions, there were no superstars, mm. but there were a lot of young people from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America and from Europe, you know, who were doing new kind of work. And I cannot tell you how much it meant to me. It made me realize, my God, nothing can substitute for this. It's not that I'm against the virtual or I'm against other ways of, by no means, but there is something about people coming together in a particular space and, and listening. You can feel the listening, you know, of course there's breathing involved in listening, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, this was a very, very heartening experience. Uh, it made me aware of how young people, in particular young theater people are exploring new forms. So I would give you two examples, Janvi. One is, uh, conversation has become very important. So conversation is now no longer like some kind of a rhetorical device. It's theater itself becomes conversation, you know? And it seems very like a slight intervention, but it's deeply meaningful, you know? The other is the format of the lecture performance with multimedia inputs. This too has become very, very, I think, popular and all kinds of new content, a lot of stuff coming out on science. Like I saw a piece on surveillance and bird life, hmm. you know, that relationship, mind blowing, you know. And now, uh, I like the fact that it was hybrid at the same time. So there were a lot of things that you could access online, but that didn't mean that you were not actually meeting in a proper space with protocols. So there's hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a new vigilance that we have to develop in going to the theater. And that meant in this particular space, you had to show your vaccination certificate, you had to be masked. Okay. Mm 
this is public responsibility, spectatorial responsibility. It's a bit uncomfortable that you do it, okay? But I feel uh, we need to keep exploring the possibilities of bringing people together and not keeping them apart. That would be my response. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that is indeed interesting. I mean, I, I remember attending my first in-person uh, workshop with just 15 academics. Mm. um you know a, a few days ago and it, it was tremendous i mean i, I don't I, mean, <laughs> I always pretend to enjoy my academic work because writing is so hard and you know um ideas have to be thought through but the joy you know was palpable for everybody you know, there's so, one really, one issue i would like technicians to when you're talking about heartbeat pulse and all we yeah. have to really i hope that uh, your science gallery will open up all these sort of psychosomatic and mm -hmm. phenomenological kinds of conditions but mm -hmm. you know it's like uh, what can i say you i've lost my train of thought is here um i'm sorry it'll come back i just i had a, i had i was thinking about yes i've got it yeah i don't know what it is about virtual communication it can be very exhausting you mm -hmm. know like when you, you've been in seminars, I'm sure that have gone on for three hours. Yes, it's been child, but you don't feel exhausted. You feel exhilarated, you know? Now, what is it about, if you had to have a three hour seminar, God help us on, on, on Zoom and many of us are doing things. It's very draining. It's very, very draining. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to do with content. It just has to do with something about energy. And this is where we have to, what is happening to our energy when we are constantly interacting with, uh, with a machine, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say that it can't be inventive. I'm, I'm not anti-technology at all, but mm -hmm. there is, I can tell you something. I can be in a rehearsal room for six hours, eight hours. I will not feel it. I will not feel exhausted. But if I had to do six hours or eight hours of rehearsal on, on, on Zoom, I'll be finished. I won't mm -hmm. be able to handle it. That's mm -hmm. the there's something to probe here, you know. Mm. Most certainly. I think so. My, my young colleagues uh, mm. uh, often speak of screen fatigue, but I'm sure there's more to it, like the research on the, uh, you know, heartbeat sinking that yeah. needs to be done. And, and we, should, we should certainly explore. And I think you've given us also another word uh, to work with because we are, we are as a team working towards our next exhibition, which is called Psyche. Oh. And so that's, you know, so psychosomatic. Yeah. Uh, phenomenon are, uh, is something most certainly we, we will uh, hopefully be able to take note of. But if nothing else, at least you know, it's it's a word that alerts us to what's coming. Uh, what's right. coming after? I have Mr. Shrivasa Murthy asking a question where he's you know I mean he, his question is of course very large, but I think the essence of it is: Are there positive lessons to be drawn from this experience? And what would you identify uh, experience of the pandemic? And so what would be those lessons for you? Many lessons, many, many, many lessons, definitely. It's been a deeply humanizing experience, you know. I think we become more mindful of the micro, mm -hmm. you know, the little conversation you may have with a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Maybe in normal time you say namaste and you walk past, but in, during the pandemic, you can't do that. You have a conversation, you know. That's very mindful. It opens up new possibility. You become far more respectful of the people who do all the hard work in our society, beginning with newspaper vendors, beginning with the milkman, beginning with the gas supplier. You know, my feeling for them has deepened. We have got to know each other a little differently. It's no longer transactional, you know. It, there's a humanization that has taken place there at some level. And we know the awareness of just injustice that has deepened. I mean, who's doing the dirty work? Who risked their lives during this time? It was yeah. people in, in nurses. It was orderly. I mean, come on, we can't, we can't ever forget that. Mm -hmm. So I think these are some of the lessons that you know we should be more mindful of at the level, at a social level, at an ethical level. You know, uh, I think there's a lot that we have learned. And the mm -hmm. uh, hardest thing is to live with ourselves. This is what mm -hmm. I have found. We're finding it very difficult to live with ourselves because we are social creatures. That's mm -hmm. lovely to acknowledge we are social beings. I think this is definitely one of the revelations. We want to be with other people. Although, you know, Sartre had once said, hell is other people. You know, I don't agree. I think uh, people can enliven you and they can, you know, make you laugh and, and do all kinds of things, mm -hmm. you know. But um, I think we have perhaps been more sensitized to our earlier indifferences to mm. relationships. 
but also to the use of resources, you know. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, Janavi, my real turn on in this, in this pandemic was science mm -hmm. because I don't have a science background. So for the first two months of the pandemic, I just binged up whatever I was hearing about zoonosis, for example. I had no concept of, I'm fascinated. I'm absolutely fascinated. I'm fascinated by what, you know, Amitabh Ghosh and others, this, you know, this is, there's some very complex relationships going on between, let's say, deforestation, global warming, mm -hmm. climate change, and, and the jumping of species, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not causal, you can't join the dots in these, yeah. there are what they call tipping points, you know, mm -hmm. when things go completely out. Now this for me, I'm humbled by this kind of research, which is genuinely interdisciplinary and holistic. So to answer that question, I think we've learned so much from it, but they're hard lessons. They're not easy lessons. So let's hope we can endure them. Yeah, I'm really, really glad you say that, you know, because I think one of our goals, uh, or not one of our goals, our only goal is to create a cultural conversation on science, right? Because what, what we have, so yeah. I, I like to say this, my team has heard me say this, I think, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. practically every day or whenever I get the opportunity, yeah. which is that we have a very strong professional conversation on science in India, which usually concerns, mm. you know, grades, upward social mobility, um, yeah. professional, right? Like in institutional rankings, um, et cetera. But we don't have a cultural conversation. Right. And the pandemic has, in a way, exposed the yes. need for that so yes. strongly. You know, we live in a world, uh, as I was speaking to some young people this morning, you know, we live in a world where we cannot allow ourselves the luxury of not knowing yes. how yeah. important this research is to everyday life and to everyday, you know, and that's culture, right? Like the circumstances of our life. Yes. It's culture. And, and, and that is where science belongs fairly and squarely and has a very, very important role. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to work with it. We need to make it a part of our lives. We need to, you know, not feel terribly burdened to discuss yes. this at yeah. the dinner table. Yeah. And, you know, how do you bring that lightness? Yeah. Uh, and by lightness, I mean, not, you know, I mean, you understand, you know, yes, I do as, understand. as you understand me and, you know, as, as I would mm -hmm. also for our audiences today and ones who listen to our recording is, is um, about, you know, this is not about pedagogy. This is not about didactics where you have to understand its content, but you have to understand its input yes. for, you know, uh, how we make meaning of our circumstances and how we make I meaning. I think here the life. role of arts plays a very integral role. Absolutely. As your own exhibition on contagion very richly shows, you know, like for example, taking the archival resources mm -hmm. of, the, and, uh, of the plague of 1896, and in a sense, sketching that out and making a mural out of it, you know, and, and, and filling and creating new stories and that yeah. kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Storytelling is important. This is something uh, that we have to keep in mind. I, I would say the transmission of knowledge mm -hmm. is crucial here. How do you transmit knowledge? Yeah. And uh, these are new challenges. It's not like say if you go to Kudiyatam or Kathakali, there are particular ways in which knowledge is transmitted in the Guru yes. Shishya, but we're not working in that frame anymore. But in the broader public domain, how do you transmit knowledge? Yep. In the broader exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, one, one where, where a historian or an accountant or a, or a um, dancer or a cinematographer feel equally a participant yes. in the conversation, right? Because yes. it's also yes. about their lives. And I think yes. that's, that's hopefully the task that you know yes. we will only get better at because uh, that a lot is at stake. Sure. Um, so if there are no further questions, um, I want to thank you hugely for taking the time to be with us this evening and for sharing your thoughts um, and I think for weaving, uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of large. Um, well, I don't know what to call it. You know, it, 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 because one paints on a canvas, one weaves a tapestry. But where you brought things together, right? The, the cultural of, uh, of, of knowledge, of practice, of affect, I think that's the most yeah. important thing yeah. because affect is something that is probably for us the most difficult thing to realize because yeah. how, what do you hold it with, yeah. right? And how do you give it hooks and anchors? And I think that, uh, so, so, um, so it was wonderful to have that element, um, you know, put forth um, and, and to be able to share that with our audiences.
uh, today and and uh, uh, hopefully the ones who will also listen to this later so thank you again it's a pleasure to see you after that many years and i and and i hope our paths cross again yeah. thank you so, so much thank you thank you thank you again so uh, to everyone our record the recording of this lecture and all our lecture is usually uploaded to our youtube channel so in case you missed our previous events and especially the lectures we have more than 20 for you to see all of whom are practitioners and scholars and artists of great depth who come with decades of experience uh, and who are able to you know bring that knowledge to share with us so please do have a look um connected programs you know, so we are ending, and I'm really excited about it personally, with the Contagion Cabaret, which is a performance screening by the theater Chipping Norton, which is now live on our website. So you'll be able to view this performance of the Contagion Cabaret until the 31st of December. Uh, and then we have a discussion, a panel discussion chaired by uh, the social uh, biologist uh, or, um, you know, uh, so someone who does socio sociobiology, Raghavendra Gadakkar. Um, from the Indian Institute of Science with Gagandeep Kang, as who, as uh, most of you are aware, is a vaccine specialist, Sally Shuttleworth, a historian of medicine, uh, Teja Varma Pusapati, John Terry, uh, Anna Tolpert, and Paul Anstel on the 17th of December at 5.30 p.m. Um, so you'll find, of course, these details uh, on our on our on our web pages. So do register and, and come for the discussion, but do watch the Contagion Cabaret as well. It is unusual, needless to say. Do give us your feedback. Um, and of course, do not uh, forget to visit the exhibition website and to let your friends know that, you know, on the 31st of December, the website comes down. So do attend our mediator-led sessions as well. And um, look forward to seeing you in our next event.